that. How did you come? What took you to Strictly? What was the what was the path that took you onto the Strictly stage? Okay, how it all began. Yeah. I guess I to go all the way back to my childhood, and I was four or five years old when I started dancing. My dad is a musician and he was always playing music in the house, phony gatherings. He had a little band and they were playing at like whatever birthday parties and um, weddings and so on. So I grew up and the fact which always fascinated everybody, which I wrote in my um, also biography about, that I grew up listening to him singing uh, Cuban music because of connection yeah. between social Russia. and socialistic Russia and Cuba. So all other music, foreign music, was actually prohibited, you know, when my dad was a young musician in the 70s in Russia. But Cuban music, because we obviously were friendly countries and friends with Fidel Castro, you know, we, we were allowed to listen to all those Bessa Mimuches and Guantanameras and all those fun, fun Latin tunes. So I grew up dancing to uh, Latin uh, tunes and absolutely loved them, loved the variety. That's all I knew as a little girl. So I loved wiggling my hips and dancing in my living room in front of my mom and dad. And as any little girl, I wanted to be a ballerina. Obviously, Russia produced a lot of famous ballerinas and ballet dancers. And my mom took me at the age of five to ballet school. But when I went to ballet school, they said, actually ballet wouldn't be something good for me because I don't have a natural turnout on my hips. And it would be very, very difficult style of dance for me to pursue, especially when I will be older uh, uh, and sort of hit my puberty. So, and the teacher just said to her, don't waste your time, don't waste her time, take her to ballroom dancing school or maybe folk dancing, whatever. So that's how it all began. So um, one rejection went to another door, another way. And I'm just like quite happy now that I didn't end up in ballet school, although I still admire and love ballet, but it doesn't present with amount of opportunities as we have in ballroom dancing. So, you know, it's an international sport. And obviously at that time it was a Soviet, Soviet Russia. I was just wanted to be the best dancer I could be. And that's the way I grew up. And this is, was my goal, just to be the best dancer I can be in my region, in my town, in my region, for my country, and so on. It was never about going somewhere abroad and also dancing on TV. TV shows didn't exist at that time, obviously. And so Russia was also closed. We only were able to travel to sort of, um, uh, in Europe to those friendly European countries. So for me, dancing was always about that passion, you know, and love for dancing. But then, you know, when the Soviet Union fell apart and, and um, perestroika happened under the uh, lead, lead, lead of the Gorbachev, you know, obviously the country all of a sudden became open and we could travel. And I did have uh, invitations to go to different countries, but I was so set in different ways in my mind. For me, it was about you know, being home, loving my country, being with my dance club, which I started teaching when I was 16. And by the age of 20, I had lots of kids. I love teaching, I love having my dance school. So one of my friends actually moved to Germany, another one to America, another one to uh, Bulgaria. And they were all calling me and saying, why don't you come over? And I was just saying, well, no, I don't really want to, you know, silly me. I was just saying, well, why would I want to go to America? You know, like, like why? So I rejected quite a few of those opportunities, but I guess that sixth sense always inside of us, you know, when we really know whether it's the right or wrong step. And so at some point I was offered actually a job to go to New York and teach there because there was lots of Russians and lots of Russian kids coming um, to, to the States. And I didn't want to go there purely because I just was offered a, um, a job as a teacher as a dance teacher, but I still was young. I was 22 at that time and I wanted to actually still compete myself. So I felt like if I make a big sacrifice going away from my family and my friends somewhere abroad, it has to be on my terms and what I was. So I didn't want to settle for anything less. So it was very, I suppose, very, um, unusual move because my friends couldn't understand that they were like are you crazy just pack your bags and go you know and I was well no you know I have I have a school kids love me I love traveling with them around the country so if I go I still want to then have an opportunity to compete and so a year later a friend of mine um who moved to the states um uh, quite a long time before me she was an uh, American champion with her husband in American style of dancing American rhythm which is a Latin dance and so she said, I have a perfect 
kind of school for you. It's in Seattle, Washington. And the school really wants to have a dance teacher who speaks Russian because there are tons of Russian families with kids who also love ballroom dancing, but they yet don't speak the language. And the reason for that, because Seattle, obviously based in Washington state, and there is a small city called Bellevue next to Seattle where Microsoft offices are. And at that time, they were basically scouting lots of people from Russian republics, ex-republics of Russia, who was very advanced in IT, and obviously all of those, um, you know, uh, basically scouting talent <laughs> and, and moving them to Microsoft quarters. And there was literally villages of families who spoke Russian or from Russian Federation. And all of them had the kids and all kids would love ballroom dancing because ballroom dancing is number one sport in Russia. And so, but they didn't speak the language yet. And so that's why they were scouting Russia uh, teachers. So I moved to Seattle and I had a, a young guy in that school who was also wanted to dance and wanted to compete. He was convinced that he had to dance with the Russian girl in order to be a champion. So kind of worked for the both of us. And we basically, so that's how I moved there. The school got me my, you know, um, uh, my uh, um, visa and so on. So it was quite seamless and nobody could quite believe it because lots of people just couldn't travel. But I went there and so started teaching the kids. And then... Um, start competing and it was literally everything I wanted took over my life and it was just such a fantastic thing and so I did be kind of at that time felt like America is the, the the land of possibilities because if you work hard and you had to work hard I moved there with the not speaking Russian one even even one word so I had to you know, go to uh, language uh, uh, lessons in the evening and, and rehearse during the day and teach the kids and all that. So, but, you know, that discipline was always in me since I was five year old. So it was a difficult thing. So I loved it and it worked very hard. And then a few years later, when we already were runners up in the professional final, so it was literally just right there, kind of reaching grab that first place to be a national champion. I got a phone call from one of my teachers who at that time retired as a dancer himself. And um, he was saying, I was asked to scout dancers, to scout professionals for a new show, which is coming from England to America on ABC called Dancer with the Stars. And I think you and obviously my partner at that time uh, uh, would be a really good choice. And I said, okay, well, tell me about the show. I remember walking down the Sunset Boulevard in, in LA after big nationals, you know, and winning Raising Star um, competition and pro division. And he was telling me all about it. And I was like, that's a, such a stupid idea. Nobody will watch the show. It, who would want me to watch dragging somebody around the floor? You know, it's like, no, I don't want to do it. So I said no to Dancing with the Stars in America. So we were so cut up in our ways to just win and be the champions and all that. So needless to say, I never won the, <laughs> the championships or didn't become the champion who was a uh, uh, um, uh, runner-up um, because there was a lot of other things came uh, uh, kind of at that point in my life. And so um, I basically moved divisions from one to the other, uh, danced with another partner and had another two, three years of successful competing. But which, which time? the dancing with the star show in America blossomed and just became the show. And then I start thinking, what have I done? Because I, I just basically missed an opportunity. And so after that, um, my partner of that time retired. He was much older. He wanted to go back to South Africa, uh, get married with his partner. And so I was sitting on my driveway at 29 years old, crying my eyes out, thinking, what the hell am I going to do now? You know, my career really is over because I finished with him in top 12 in the world. And that took such hard work, education, money, everything. I didn't have a thing to my name, no house, no flat, no nothing, nothing. It was absolutely nothing because everything was going back to financing my dancing because in our dance world, we, we don't have the, you know, um, people who sponsor us you know, and no federations were sponsored. It was all basically at your own stance and everything I worked, you know, every all the money from teaching put back into customs, travels and all of that. And it's obviously also political world. So to go back with a new partner would take me probably another five, six, seven years. And I would probably never even make it to the quarter, to the semi-final of the world again. So I just thought I don't want to do that. So I thought I'm just going to get my teaching qualifications and, and um, you know, just teach, you know, do exams and so on, open the school again. 
And once again, the same teacher called me and said, look, I heard you split up with your partner. I, I am now choreographing Dancing on the Stars Light Tour. And I would really like you to be one of the company dancers. So you will be in the background, but you'll be a company dancer and you will see for yourself what it's all about working kind of, you know, with the TV stars and so on. So of course I grabbed the opportunity. There was the winter tour of Dancing with the Stars of 2007 in 2008. So we traveled the US for two months, on big buses with a lot of other celebs, which was amazing. And obviously it intrigued me, you know, that world of sort of TV and so on. And all of the producers were British because the show came from here, from the UK. And so I remember like now sitting in the back of the bus, bus of the last um, week of the tour and saying, how can I try for the show? Where can I go from here? And they said, look, we will be honest, we don't need any more anyone on, on Dancing with the Stars. We have about four now Eastern European girls. Obviously, we kind of don't need, need another one, you know, but let us kind of put the fillers out because maybe, you know, some other show around the uh, world looking for dancers. And so, um, yeah, they basically reached out to the UK show. They were expanding. They wanted uh, uh, another, like a couple basically join, not like a couple being together, but like a dance, you know, a boy and a girl from perhaps different country. And so, yeah, and um, they put us in touch. It was me and Brian Fortuna who did um, Strictly for two years with me and he back to, went back to the States. And so the show producer responded and they said, look, we're literally closing our auditions like tomorrow. You've got to get on the flight, fly into the um, UK and do a screen test, which I had nothing, nothing about. I did, I did not anything about it. So we flew in, got up in the morning, went to BBC, uh, uh, the donut, you know, the courts in the White City. And so, yeah, it was a like really crazy experience. I had to sit in front of cameras for 45 minutes, answering all sorts of uh, um, uh, questions and then, I had a runner, you know, who never danced before, just the guy who started working for BBC, bringing coffees and stuff. And I had to teach him on camera, a basic cha-cha-cha and basic waltz, you know, to see how my teaching skills are. So we both done that, myself and Brian. We got on flight back. And honestly, I never thought for a million years I'm going to get the job because I thought, well, why me? You know, there's millions of girls trying um, for the show. I went back. And I organized also at that time, I became a, a, a US citizen. And so I organized my mom's papers as well, you know, to come under the shame and, you know, work very hard, did it all myself because I didn't have money to pay lawyers to organize kind of her papers coming into. So I did a lot of work to bring her over, she rented our flat in America, in Russia. And when she came to LA, to my little tiny little rented flat, Literally within the week, I got a phone call from, you know, British producer saying, we would like you to be on the show and you need to be here from the 1st of August. And so I sat in front of my mom, who still was recovering from jet lag, you know, after flying like what, 20 hours, saying, mom, I'm moving to the UK. And she literally, I thought she was going to kill me with her bare hands because she was like, how could you do it to me? I was away from you for like four or five years. And then we just organized all that. I rented the flat in Russia and you're saying you're moving away again. It's like, what's wrong with you? She's like, what is wrong with you? You know? <laughs> and I said, I said, mom, it's not, it's temporary. They just want me for one season, you know, because the, um, the, um, the contract was only for four months. Um, from August till, well, December, five months, and that was it. So I said, it's temporary, you know, I'll make a bit of money, and basically I'll be here in, in LA. Off I go. So came to, in August, August 1st, you know, landed here. It was completely new thing, new stuff. I didn't know a single soul in the UK besides Brian, with whom I moved here, and the journey began. And here I am, 14 years later, talking to you. So that's how it's all started. <laughs> Long way around. I think, I think that some people have got some questions for you. Sure. So, Julia, can you unmute yourself? Hi, Christina. Hi. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, 
I can, I can totally understand about you've seen the highs and lows of dancing, winning or not winning, shall we say, the competitions in a, in a competitive environment. But from your time on Strictly, what would you say has been a high point, excluding Ben, obviously, um, and what would you say has been a low point for you? You know, looking back, there was a lot of things which have been hacked out as the highest and lowest. I think you go through such an incredible emotional roller coaster because nobody can quite understand the amount of pressure you under. When you have 13 million people watching you at home and you understand that whatever you say, whatever you do will be judged, will be multiplied in press, will be like, you know, speak about by every single, spoken about by every single person who is watching the show. So that pressure and stress you go through is, is, I can't really describe it. You just have to experience it really. And um, the lowest, well, starting from the beginning of the show when I was starting with John Sargent. So, as you can remember, probably if you, uh, you know, into the show, he re stepped out, you know, he resigned halfway through, not halfway through, but by the quarterfinals. So that was definitely a very scary moment because all of a sudden, and I've never experienced that before, and I wasn't media trained as well, I was literally waking up, walking outside with 25 reporters outside of my tiny flat. And so it was just something really scary because I wasn't prepped for that. I didn't know how to deal with this. And so I felt like just, I don't know, and then there was all the stories in the press, you know, that I'm not supporting him was, was really hurtful because I was actually supporting him, but because I didn't want to comment, you know, on that which I actually never do, if you kind of know any, anything about me, that um, it, it was really hurtful and, and then created more ripple effects, you know, obviously on the show. And it just really was uh, something I wasn't prepared to deal with. So that was an emotionally a low point, the first one. And so it was, yeah, like something I never experienced before. Highest points, it was tons of them, you know, making to the finals with, um, um, Jason Donovan and Simon Webb, and um, obviously winning Strictly um, Christmas special with John Barron. And so it was a lot of great high points. Uh, meeting Ben, of course, you know, but every time, you know, I'm a very emotional person and everything I do, I take to heart. So every time my celebrity did well, I was literally on like cloud nine because I felt like, you know, I've done such a great job and um, so on. Can you just excuse me for a second? Just one second, guys, very sorry. I reckon that will be somebody at the front door. <laughs> Deeply voice, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> for my lovely vegan cakes so um so where I was I yeah so it's just incredibly um always high and low and I think it multiplies because you know you understand how much pressure you want that and then it also goes into press and you know we all know what press is like writing all sorts of things uh, you know and you're kind of waking up to amount of like, you know, articles around you have nothing about. So that, that, that's really um, a difficult part of the being, you know, exposed, I suppose, on TV. But there is obviously a beautiful part of that too, because you gain so much experience and mostly you gain that inner strength because without it, you can't carry on. And people did come and, and leave the show simply because they couldn't cope. And I'm talking about professionals. So you definitely kind of learning a lot about yourself, you know. I can imagine. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. So, has anyone else got any questions? Me, Sheila, if that's possible. Yes, go ahead. I know a bit. Hi, Christine. I love your story and it's fascinating, really inspirational. Um, with So Yoga, obviously, I'm now a member. Yeah, welcome to Hi. the family. Yeah, Chris, Christine had me up in a headstand the other day. She said, Come on, you can yeah. do it. And I went, Oh, God, really? All right. Then. So, but yeah, <laughs> your hands down. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there you've created a really amazing space, and, and I'm personally loving it. And so is my husband, which is great. But was that a dream of yours? Was that something that you wanted to do? Um, Thank you. Such a good question. And also, it, it, it was very. Um, so with yoga, where it all began, it was actually back in America. So my dance partner um, in Seattle, he introduced me to hot yoga. Literally, we all know this is a Bikram yoga because when I moved to the States in 2001, that's literally what was 
out there on every single corner, wherever you go, hot yoga, hot yoga, Bikram yoga, Bikram yoga. <coughs> Very different types and spectrums of that yoga. So one was yoga, hot yoga. The other one was all the chanting, all the sort of oming and stuff like that. And as a young girl, obviously, I wasn't into that spirituality yet. I didn't know anything about yoga coming from Russia. You know, I had like a vague idea of that. But literally the day after I landed, we went to rehearsals and he took me to the hot yoga. Again, didn't in the language, was just following the teachers. Um, somebody needs to meet themselves. I'm not sure who that is. Um, and so, but that first experience was so long because it was so hot, you know, <laughs> sweating with another 40 people in the room. And I thought it's some kind of torture, you know, he put me through specifically um, just to see how I cope. But then the next day I craved it so much. My body craved it. I just couldn't get enough of it. I wanted to go back to the studio. So that feeling of detoxification, the lightness in the body, the, as a dancer, we all love it. Like all dancers, all ballet dancers, gymnasts, they all love it hot yoga because it just obviously bans your body and flexibility get rid of those aches and stuff like that so the, the love for yoga was kind of born then and it was basically literally we went to yoga classes four or five times a week to hot yoga and especially before competitions so it was just that moving meditation where i can be for an hour with myself without worries without anything else and it has exa exactly the same effect on the body and the mind as dancing because when you do your, those two disciplines you cannot think of anything else you can't worry you can't be stressed you can't be anything you just in your being and it takes all your being from here to there you in that one hour bubble with yourself and i love that whether it's dancing or it's, it's yoga and so I remember one time, and it's a true story, I swear on my child that it's a true story. One time we walk into the room and the teacher was, a, a, we were so much there, so everybody knew us. And then one of the studio owners was actually our friend of the family. And so we walked into the studio and the teacher was sick. And then they literally asked me on the spot, would you teach a class? And I said, I can't even speak the language. I was like, my English is bad. And they said, just, just move. Just stand there and move. And everybody will just follow you. And I knocked down at 90 minutes, Bikram yoga, you know, from beginning to the end, without the words, just breathing, guiding people, you know, through all these postures. And when I come out of it, everybody just kind of give me a little applause, say thank you, because it was 20 people in the class. And, you know, they, you know, they didn't want to go home. They just wanted the yoga class. And so, and, and even then I thought, do you know what? One day I probably will get back to it and I will be doing yoga myself. So it's always stayed there. The first thing I Googled when I moved to the UK, when I moved to London, hot yoga studio. And I remember right, like now, walking into that Bolsover Street um, little studio, which used to be Bikram, and now I think it's Forest Yoga, it's called Forest Yoga. So, you know, I just loved it so much. And I think when I obviously had me let and moved to Northampton, I had to kind of think, well, what's next? And we sit down with Ben and our job takes us all over the country in different places and we move, you know, so we kind of wanted to create something which will keep us together here at home and also something we can pass on to the children. And he obviously has a, as a world champion, an array of knowledge and fitness and how to do it properly and so on. And, you know, I just said, you know, at that time, I said, do you know what? I'm going to go and get my teaching qualifications as a yoga teacher because I've practiced it for 22 years. I've also been teaching dancing for 22 years, 25 years. So I know that I can be a good teacher in yoga because I can combine that knowledge. I just wanted, obviously, to be qualified as many styles as I can. And so I did it. After six months of having Mila, I just found, you know, 200 hours teacher training and I've done that. And I did tons of add-ons and that's how So Yoga was born. We just wanted to create a well-being center where grandparents can come with kids. Kids will go to one class. Grandparents can do some nice, gentle yoga class and everything in between. So we just really thought of something. We never wanted the gym. We really wanted the well-being center where all this, everything from meditation, but also to advanced fitness classes can exist under the same roof. And that's how it all came together. Christina, there's, um, there's quite a few questions in the chat. They're now popping up. I can, yeah, can I ask you a question about John Sargent? <laughs> what is the question? <laughs> Hi, Christina, it's me. Hello, it's Sarah. Hello, so, so my John Sargent thing was, for me, and I realise now that it was a really dark time for you, which I hadn't realised at all, but for me, it was my TV gold. Even now, when I want something to cheer me up, that passo is just, yeah. I, 
I adored it. But how did you how did you come up with your choreography? And did you know that the world would react to it like as it did do? Well, I didn't actually. The, the thing when he drags me across the floor, would you believe that I had a similar kind of thing with my professional partner dancing in Blackpool, Winter Gardens, my last ever international competition, you know, as a professional. So we kind of had the same beginning. He was like kind of moving me quickly around and would drop on the floor and he would drag me a little bit. So when I got into the room with John Sarge, obviously we all know that, you know, he wasn't the best dancer, but he was an amazing performer. And it's just... Like the thing is, it was such a joy to work with him because he was the, the only one out of all my dance partners, all of them on Strictly, who didn't worry going on the floor. He just didn't worry. He was like, yeah, let's go have a dance. You know, he didn't take himself too seriously. And I think that was the best asset he had because he just wanted to entertain people. He knew he's not the best dancer. So there was no pressure in that. He just wanted to like, you know, have a good little story or performance. So when we started doing the pasta doble, you know, try to give him a couple of basic steps. He just was not registering. You know? So, and I start thinking like, well, what can I do? So I thought, okay, drag me across the floor. Let's try that. Just, just, just move, just walk, <laughs> walk and drag me. And that's exactly what happened. But I didn't think it's going to look comical. Obviously I still try to do it decent. So it looks good for the judges. So, but when we've done that, obviously on the, on that day in the, in the dress rehearsal, people just start giggling in the audience, you know, the, the, the runners, the makeup artists, and I thought, what's so funny, <laughs> you know, I like, I worked really hard to make it happen. And so, and here comes the live show and the judges were just kind of going to town how bad it was and everybody was laughing. But when I looked back, I actually saw the, how comical it was because he couldn't really drag me because he wasn't strong enough. And his heels was hitting the forehead, my forehead. It was just ridiculous look, you know, but it was just kind of funny. I think it was such a strange kind of misfit couple, but it worked at the same time. So yeah, it was, it was brilliant. And no, I didn't think it's going to be such an uh, kind of iconic for the wrong reason. Um, Oh, I thought it was amazing. You knew your smile on your face, even though you were being dragged across the floor, which is, that is a true professional. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That leads on to the next question about costume malfunctions. Yep. What's been the worst costume malfunction if you ever had to deal with it? And what was your favorite costume wear on Strictly? Um, oh, gosh, there was so many beautiful gowns of wearing strictly shame we can't like ever hold them um it was a lot of them i really cannot say i think which one i like the most i think um i think i'm always gonna love my origin tango purple dress with simon Webb. i think it's just because another very iconic um sort of dance for me personally on the show and kind of made me feel amazing so that's one of my favorite customs they um, sort of um, malfunction was only one, thankfully. Um, I did step on my skirts a lot, you know, like maybe in dress runs, but that's why dress runs exist. Um, sort of um, before the live show, because we can, you know, that's what, for the first time when we're actually wearing our actual costumes, and that's where we can fix them before the live show. So yes, I stopped, stepped maybe a couple of times in the skirt, but one time did happen on a live tour. I was dancing with Jimmy Mystery actually, and it was a pass of doubly he did with his partner Flavio on the show. So I had to also do that. And it was to Thriller, so because he was performing on the show during Halloween, but also on the tour we did it as what he had. And literally at the beginning of the dance, I was, lifting my hands up and the strap came off so it just came undone so i hold quickly <laughs> and they stopped the show they stopped the whole thing it's obviously life arena it was in glasgow so it was a lot of you know funny now noises um in the audience i mean glasgow known for an amazing sort of um audience really and um it's so warm always so they were very cheerful they were very um, supportive and so I had to go backstage quickly fix it come back on and do do the dance again so ho it, thankfully there was nothing awful you know nothing terrible happened but it was only one time yeah okay um so which pro dancers did you get on best with Robin Windsor would be obviously he was my dance partner 
<laughs> on the show, Pro Partner. Um, we're still in touch, we're still the show. Sometimes we're always invited to do some uh, exhibitions or like events, you know, for various things. Not now, obviously, but literally right before the uh, lockdown, we did our last one uh, in Scotland, <laughs> funny enough, again in Glasgow. In Glasgow. Um, literally, it was like a 8th or 9th of March, and that was the last one. So, yeah, probably. In, I mean, I do get along with a lot of them, and I still have uh, Tristan McManus. That's another, obviously, uh, guy who was in Strictly, and we're still sometimes doing shows here and there if it's possible. But he's now a judge on Australian show, Dancing with the Stars, along Craig Rebel Hallwood. So, um, so this is Julia. Would like to know you to share a backstage secret with us all because we're hanging off your every word. Sorry, Christina. I, I love the gossip. Tell us what's been going on. I do not know. I think, I think Christina, actually, I'm asking the question that everyone is thinking. Yeah, which one? Yeah, well, no, to tell us some gossip. No, tell I don't think that we won't know. The last conversation I had with the producers, they asked me to come and do a yeah, It Takes Two in November. So yeah. we'll in that and that's about it so i don't really know backstage cousin because obviously i'm not that in that um uh, bubble anymore and also you must remember i only have only four dancers now left on the show who was in my year so it's gavin hauer Jeanette and aliash and giovanni everybody else is new and so, although I know of them, I never work with them together. So I don't really know any gossip, you know? So um, Oti as well, yeah. Actually, I did speak to Oti the other day because I'm going to Germany next Tuesday for a dance conference. So I just needed to check something with her because she lived and her husband is from there. So yeah, but I don't ask about gossip because sort of, you know, what can I ask? They're just now beginning the show as well. Um, all I know that all of the group numbers are already pre-recorded, they've been done before, um, they're not allowed any extras obviously in them and any kind of extras at the um, sort of VTs, just the family and friends of the uh, celebs. So it will be a very different show this year, but I'm sure they're going to do amazing jobs always. That's it. So Jeanette wants to know, do you have a special diet to maintain your energy and flexibility? Well, I'm vegan, so I became vegan four years ago after I finished breastfeeding Mila. And so that was a kind of natural progression, not much to do with maybe, I mean, what really happened that um, obviously after finishing my yoga teacher training, um, you know, it kind of goes with the philosophy of yoga because yoga is a philosophy. It's not actually what we know as a physical movement. It's only one little limb of that. Um, so it's about non-harming, about moral conduct to yourself, to outside world no harm you know to others uh, no living being and so on so eating animals was sort of becoming a bit of an issue for me when i was doing that um and so but it wasn't a very hard transition because i grew up in the seaport in russia so i grew up eating seafood fish seafood i never really was meat lover anyway i never really, really ate it maybe a bit of chicken i find it boring so i don't really eat it anyway so you know, I always gravitated towards lots of vegetables, so lots of fruit because they make you feel good. You try to eat healthy, you know, when you're a dancer because it's definitely affect your energy level. If you feed, if you eat good carbs, um, sort of like complex carbs, which give you energy for a long time, and we kind of all survive on like, it sounds wrong, but we survive on like brown rice and beans and and um, like um, things like um, or what you know buckwheat and all this kind of thing. Sounds boring, but these are the things can give you energy for a long time and long hours. And so before the competition, this is something you will eat to make sure you have that energy for like let's say two three hours of dancing, where high impact obviously uh, uh, dancing. And so that's kind of natural for me anyway. So I didn't really struggle uh, in moving into veganism. And now I think it's quite easy for, because we have so many other um, food chains offering vegan ready meals. So that's what I have. And I, and I definitely think, you know, I'm, I, I, I do love um, forever living products. I've been ambassador for the company for five years. And I'm never going to become an ambassador for something I don't love. And so that started from the fact that I just aloe vera. I love the, the, the healing power of the plants. I drink it every single morning. Nice for my body, nice for my skin, you know, and for my um, gut, basically. So this is something 
it's like a little ritual. I wake up and I have an aloe vera juice with a glass of water and then I carry on with my coffees and stuff like that. But that's really it. I don't have any kind of like a big secret I'm going to reveal. <laughs> that's that's kind of it really. So, but I, I love this question from Tracy. Um, I absolutely adored Bruce Forsyth, even, even as a child. Please tell me he was as lovely off screen as he was on. He, he, he was a grumpy old man. Let's not get it wrong. You know, he was. <laughs> but he was grumpy to everybody but dancers. That's the thing. Because he started as a dancer himself. And he had no end of fights with the producers. And we all loved him for that. You know, when we would work long hours on like those Saturdays. Because our Saturdays, as you understand, you know, we start like in makeup and hair sometimes as early as 7 a.m. And your performance is 6 p.m. at night on live show. We're all there all day long, rehearsing, dancing. After that, you do your live show. After that, votes for half an hour. After that, we're filming the um, Sunday show, which you all see obviously on Sunday, but we do it on a Saturday night. So we would go home about midnight. So think about that amount of hours, 6 a.m. to 12 p.m. So we would like just being exhausted and there would be like, you know, the producers coming, oh, let's reshoot this and re let's redo that. Let's redo that. Let's pick up that phrase from the judges. And we would be just completely exhausted, you know, and he would always have a go with them, which we all loved. You know, he would say, how dare you? They've been dancing on the feet for all, all day long. You've got to get them going home. You know, so he was always so ever sweet. He was ever also very sweet to Ben. And when he was kicked out of the show, you know, he literally was stamping his feet in the corridor saying, this is outrageous. This is not right, you know. And he was like so sweet, you know, it was awesome. He was like, like he obviously knew John Sargent for a long time. They always had a little chat, you know, about this and that. And I remember, I think where really issues began with the press and other dancers, you know, why can't the John felt he had to leave in the quarterfinals because good dancers were leaving. And it was all about the kind of about John and Christina. You know, Bruce Forth had virtually opened the show. I can't remember which episode was Welcome to John and Christina show. <laughs> and so while it was a fun joke for everybody, other dancers and celebrities celebrity didn't take it well. So that's when it's all kind of got a little bit out of hands. But yeah, he was ever so lovely, you know. And um, I am just very blessed to say that I saw his last show. He was going on, he was on tour, you know, when he already left Strictly. And that was my last year on the show. So it must have been 2013. And his wife texted me and she said, we're doing, he's doing the very last show at the Apollo and basically it's gonna be just, you know, friends and family. Would you like to come? And I said, obviously I do. So I went there and saw him performing. And you know what? It was such a big difference between who he was that last year on Strictly, feeling bad about himself that he can't read autocues and all that which he was mocked for and kind of basically pushed out of the show but when he was on stage and he was entertaining everybody for two hours dancing still tapping and singing and obviously dave arch you know band which was on strictly was behind him and he was just it was just entertainment at, at, at its best and he was incredible and you can you just realize that he is an ultimate, like incredible performer. And, you know, he just was not right when he was scripted, but he, when he was himself, he was outstanding, you know, and I'm just so happy I got to see it. So, yeah. <laughs> Tracy's over the moon now with your answer. <laughs> um, I said, oh, Dawn has put a question in there. Um, about there being a lot of jealousy about costumes and who wears the nicest among the ladies? Or is there support there with everyone? So is the jealousy? I don't know. I think, you know, I we do have a bit of say in costumes, not the, for like team weeks, for example, if it's like maybe Halloween or more like a musical theatre, obviously you're going to be in the costume of what you meant to wear for that particular, I don't know, show, show piece or whatever you know, to go along with the musical. But in general, you kind of can say like, don't like, you kind of, because DSI is a 
costume company which provides and makes costume for all of the dancers around the world. So at the beginning of the show, they bring a bunch of costumes. You choose your one, you choose what fits you, you tell them what you want to change and that. So I think everybody quite happy is what they're wearing unless it's, um, like I said, maybe like a movie week or um, like a, um, a musical theater week. So then you don't have a say because it has, has, has to go with what you're dancing to, you know. So that's that. Right, has anybody else got any questions? Oh, you're all very quiet. <laughs> the board I'm looking through my screens. <laughs> so I'll tell you, Christine, I've got something to tell you, actually. Um, in fact, you've not talked about your children's classes, the classes that you teach at So Yoga. And I'm going to tell you all now. My little nephew, who's seven, um, he, he's always dressed up in like the greatest showman things. And so because he was bored in lockdown, we fixed up with Christina for him to have some Zoom um, classes, which we did on Sunday afternoons that went great. And he loved it. They danced with sharks. That's another story. And then when when Christina reopened, uh, I got him down from Cheshire. It's a three hour drive for a little boy. That's a lot. Um, and he came and did his first ever dance class. Um, since then, he's started theatre school up in Cheshire and his mum, I messaged his mum today to ask how theatre school is going and she said last time she picked him up he had a face he was like all glum and, and she said, what's the matter with you? And he said, I didn't want it to end. <laughs> so, so we talk about the yoga and the dancing and the Strictly but the, the difference you're making to children through your classes at So Yoga, I'm a first-hand witness of that. It, it's brilliant what you're doing. You have got a talent with children. I did, well, I started teaching on the literature when I was 16 because my dance teacher asked me to help him out with the little ones. Like I'm doing now with my, one of my girls from the um, Advanced Technique Adult uh, like older class. So I just loved it. I loved it. I loved that I can get a little bit of money, you know, myself. And love was born. I love, I love teaching. I love to kids. And so it's like I said, like, for so long I've been teaching it's so natural to me I think I can write the book myself how to teach children with different um you know attention spans in different ways like I literally I can't say I'm a guru but I can definitely say in 25 years of teaching I had a lot of different kids coming through the doors some of them didn't want to talk to me or sit in the corner crying or whatever and I can say that 99.9 .9 of all those kids that came back who continue dancing if, if not with me with somebody else i think when you truly love what you do yourself that natural you know kind of passion kind of passes on because it's not i'm doing something just you know i have to do whatever it's i love it and and kids give you such an amazing energy and i just absolutely love it and i also like teaching uh kids yoga that's another kind of passion i discovered obviously through learning yoga and i did my add-on for teaching children and that's a, such a beautiful thing to do because we do a lot of different stuff like they have to besides doing poses and thinking about what kind of like we start again okay put your hands together let's plant the seed of love and kindness and happiness and grow the tree of happiness and then everybody has to say what kind of tree they grow and they say well it's a magical world you can grow any tree and kids come out with some crazy things you know they the grow a tree of um watermelons for example one grow a cheeseburger tree and another one grown a tree of no fights you know and when they start saying that to you like um i wanted to grow a tree that nobody fights anymore around me and it was so sweet you know like you hear kids saying that they start expressing themselves you know through words or they would draw as a draw for me you know uh, something you love and something you want to take away something bad from the from the world and they draw all the other things one kid draw broccoli <laughs> <laughs> they decided that the broccoli is not good for anybody because they hate it and then one another one obviously draw um again the virus you know coronavirus and we were scratching it there and another little girl draw again said i don't want my parents to fight and i said okay we draw how you feel that feeling and the, she draw a cloud and she scratched it and so i was able to a little bit in a very nice way communicate with the parent. and so i think those are things are beautiful and they come out through yoga teaching you know where we all kind and accept each other and so on and so i think to generate it in children and young age and let them experience 
experience that and also able to speak or draw it, it's a big deal, you know. So they, they feel very comfortable doing that with me, which I love, you know, I appreciate that. So We've got some more chat going on in the chat box. Um, so is Anton a diva? Kate wants to know. He's a diva. He can be a diva. Look, we all can be, you know, I mean, we all can have that, but he's a natural he is actually a great guy really good guy really good friend um helped me no end but i used to i used to uh, be a, a patron for a children's um charity back in london kind of left when i had the baby and so he absolutely free used to host my dinners um along with other uh, dancers from the show and you know he makes a lot of money hosting things like that you know but you know he would always give me his free time and that's you know that's it it's a sign of a great person so do you think he'll ever get um, a job on the on the judges bench? I don't know. I think the problem is with that. You know, when you put an ex pro on that panel, it will be a lot of other ones. I'm happy pros. Why her or why him? You know, I think people were tipping like Anton for many years to be a judge, but they're kind of keeping it still. You know, I think they allowed him to do it once for Christmas special when um, I think Craig wasn't available. Um, I think, yeah, you know, but like, I don't have an issue for the movie and on, I think it will be a great fit, you know, but who knows, maybe in 10 years, you know. <laughs> Thank you. So, and um, so what kind of dance is your favorite and why? Do you know what, it, it swings roundabout. Some days you feel like you love waltz or foxtrot. You want something mellow, relaxing, graceful and dance, you know, and some days you feel like jive, putting something really fast and furious and kind of kick your legs. Um, so obviously I teach kids classes uh, pretty much every day here before the yoga classes in the evening. And so, you know, I have to teach different things. It doesn't matter what I like. I just I still have to uh, give a little bit of every week, you know, different stuff. But my personal, my Cuban dance, like I said, going back to my five-year-old me when I was dancing in my little flat back in Russia to Cuban songs sang by my dad and his band, because of the whole Cuban and Russian socialistic connections at that time, you know, it's kind of always going to be in my heart. I just love those Cuban, that Cuban music. My dream to go to Cuba, I don't know when it's going to happen now, you know, it's like a bucket list thing to go to Havana, you know, experience it, like dance my heart out and those, you know, salsa clubs, whatever, see where it's all originated. And so, yeah, you know, that's, I suppose, kind of, like I said, depends on the mood. And I'm with a wind and it depends on what I want to dance to. So Catherine wants to know how hard is it to keep quiet when the public kicks out a dancer or celeb who shouldn't who shouldn't be kicked out? I mean, look, we can't do anything about it because we obviously kind of sworn to secrecy as um, dancers and pro, pros and celebs on Strictly. But the people do leak it sometimes. There is a whole kind of dark web of Strictly come dancing and you can go on that web, uh, website. Gosh, I can't even remember what it's called. You know, I had a couple of spies on that before. <laughs> <laughs> my my um, little spies who are running a lot of um, sort of fan pages um, for me, uh, not for me, but they organize it themselves and I just know of them for many years now. So it's all kind of out there. So it's not, you know, the press invited and they can watch the show. They're not allowed to publish anything till the next day obviously but yeah it is hard it's hard not to kind of scream sometimes out there like oh, why did it happen it's not right but you have to wait till next day you know and be graceful in your defeat <laughs> and Catherine also wants to know um is it just me who thinks the American smooth dance is really dull <laughs> So American smooth, what's really interesting about it? I love American smooth because it's obviously we can do lifts, right? So when you have somebody, okay, let's say maybe not like amazing, at like dancing itself, but very strong, you can do lots of very effective lifts and kind of hide that, you know, do a little bit of walls, a little bit of foxtrot and do kind of very impressive lifts. But American Smooth, we know it on Strictly as a style, obviously of one dance and could be anything, like any ballroom dance besides tango with a lift. But in American, in the, in, in the States, in the United States, there is actually competition in American Smooth. So it's American rhythm, 
and American Smooth. And American Smooth has four dancers in it, Waltz, Venice Waltz, um, uh, Quick, Quick Step and Foxtrot. And no, Tango as well. So I think they don't have actually a Quick Step. And so it's very much like a Fred and Ginger kind of, you know, what we know in uh, them dancing, obviously that sort of style of dance. And it's beautiful to watch. It's absolutely out of this world. And it's now becoming more and more world known. And even in Blackpool now, they have American smooth competitions. So I personally love that style for many different reasons. But now I know more about it, I'll be able to watch it in a different way. So <laughs> I've learned something. Thank you. Okay, so to wrap up, I, um, I like this from Jeanette. Uh, Argentinian tango is my absolute favourite and you do it fabulously, darling. Hello, Jeanette. Hello, Jeanette. Thank you for kind words. Um, do you know what? It's a weird way how it came about with Argentine tango. So back into competing before even going on Strictly or Dancing with the Stars. And my partner of that time, Michael Wentick, who was a world champion. I was like, we were like in um, top 12 in the world. We were invited to do a show for amateur competition, world, uh, like a world national, a uh, world um, amateur competition in Buenos Aires. But they invited professional couples to do a show. So it was absolutely incredible because we went obviously to um, Argentina and yeah. so we danced the show and then the next day I, there was a show case by the Argentinian couple, you know, the Argentango couple, the champ world champions and we asked them for a, a, a lesson. And so we went and stayed to their studio and um, so it was absolutely incredible. What was incredible that the guy who I never danced before, and I know nothing about Argentine tango, so I just watched it, and because it's not an hour Latin or ballroom division, he just took his me in his arms and started leading me, and I was able to do the steps and even the lifts and the lean and all the beautiful kind of rounding things with the legs, and I just absolutely fell in love, and it was it was so incredible that somebody could do that. You know, with me, trained dancers, a trained dancer, and I kind of let go and just let it be, and it was absolutely incredible. My partner Michael hated it because for him, <laughs> it's all about knowing how to lead, hold a lady a certain way, and this guy, this kind of older gentleman, was saying, "No, no, no, don't, don't do that, don't do that. Put your hands down. Don't be so strong. You know, let it flow." So he walked out fuming, and I walked out happy. So it was very different things, you know, a different experience for the two of us. But I think it's just because I felt that flavor. I felt what it feels like to have authentic Argentine tango that definitely helped me on Strictly because I'm not trained in that but I think I always had an eye for choreography hmm. good choreography for not for me but for the partner I'm dancing with because it's about them and about not about me and I think a lot of new pros are missing the trick a little bit because again it's not about me it's about them so I had to showcase them and so that with that in mind you know I think it's always kind of went into that sort of a special Argentine tango performances, you know. Um, Thank you. Has anybody else got any questions? No? Okay. Well, Christina, thank you very, very much for today. I think everybody's enjoyed you. I can see from Thank the you. John Branson is going to be coming along to meet you. Come over for a cup of coffee, two hours, so yoga in the cafe, have a look around and, um, you know, have a chat here. <laughs> okay. uh, I'll speak to you again. I think I might see you this evening because I'm coming to yoga. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. bye.